Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor and high sis. I haven't talked to her for a while. You've got to remember to say hello to my sister. Well, we're going to start today with TEFI data just because it's kind of interesting. Um, measles has been detected in Austin. Low levels of H5N1 bird flu was detected in a Houston site. A little scary. Don't know what the, what's going on there. And SARS is beginning to inch up. And we're going to talk about that because it's really fascinating. But first, no way we can get around measles. So I've been saying for a long time, you know how we're not great, but thank God for Canada because they are actually worse than us. Our, our neighbors to the north are actually doing a worse job than we are. So while we're fighting about tariffs and all that kind of stuff, we can always fight about measles. That's one thing we're doing better than they are. So as I mentioned uh, the last several weeks, we're up to 1,300 cases more than any year since it was eliminated, uh, supposedly eliminated in the United States in 2000. But there have been 3,800 cases in Canada, mostly in children. Uh, you put that in perspective, three times more cases in Canada, and they have one-eighth the population. So not all, I mean, <laughs> they're doing really bad. And almost all these cases are in unvaccinated folks. And Alberta, the province is, Alberta is the province at the center of the current outbreak. They have the highest per capita measles spread rate in all of North America, followed by Ontario and Manitoba. And the case numbers are going up so fast in Alberta, they, really, they don't really know where the source is. It's kind of interesting. It does raise the question, you know, why is it spreading so rapidly in Canada versus the United States? It's a more, much more sparsely populated. But their vaccine problems are probably bigger than ours. So just as an example, uh, there are many cases, you know, not only in North America, but Europe, we talked about in UK. Uh, Europe is over several hundred thousand cases, but England has nearly 3,000 cases, highest since 2012. Uh, Canada's figures are, are higher than its peak was in 2011. 2011, they had 750 cases, and now they're up to 3,800. It's mostly, in Ontario, it's been mostly spread among the German-speaking Mennonite community. So that's another similarity. We have Mennonite community in Texas, Mennonite community there, who are very reluctant to get vaccination for their children. And it was interesting, there's a medical officer from Canada who was in that community who said, it's not so much that they, have, they haven't embraced vaccination as a community as much as the misinformation that they're receiving that says that vaccines are dangerous. So it's in that medical officer's view, it's not so much vaccine hesitancy as much as the misinformation that vaccines can really uh, be harmful. And they also, uh, he also, this medical officer also said that there's a distrust in the healthcare system. Well, that's pretty much everywhere. But this is kind of fascinating if you look at this. I mean, this, these are the cases in Canada. And look at the red bar. It's like 2025 compared to all the other cases. And just as an example, uh, I've mentioned our MMR rates dropping in the United States, but in Alberta, their MMR vaccine has dropped nearly in half. So at a 50% rate of vaccination for things like MMR, it's, that's really, really bad. So now we can turn to the United States, which by comparison looks great. I mean, we've only had 1,300 cases. I mean, we should have zero, but we've had 1,300 cases, 13% uh, hospitalizations, three deaths, and as you can see, we have surpassed the highest number we had uh, since 2000 in 2019, 1274. And cases are going down, but there's still cases. And Texas, of course, leads the way. 762 cases back in July, uh, eight, July 8th, there were only 753. So it's, it's still trickling along and still mostly in that uh, community. But as I mentioned, Austin now has, has some cases. So I want to turn to COVID because I think we're going to start seeing a real problem with COVID as the summer progresses. I showed this last week that there seems to be these summer surges. So it's looking more like twice a year uh, surges with COVID. And sure enough, if you look at the percent of tests positive for uh, respiratory viruses, you can see influenza and RSV are gone pretty much in July. But you can see that COVID's, first of all, never really bottomed out and is beginning to turn up. And that's, you know, I've been saying all along, the virus is around. We've had resistance as a community because we either had it or got vaccinated. Now the virus is evolving 
and it's going up. And just as a great example, look at the traveler's data. This is from people who are entering. It doesn't necessarily mean foreign folks. It's people who are traveling and coming back into the United States. This is planes and airports, and you can see a pretty dramatic increase. And just keep this in mind, the main variant is FX, that XFG, 52% of the viruses in that, uh, in traveler's data are, 50, are XFG. So this is another fascinating thing. You know, I've talked about the wastewater data being the only data we've had that anticipates what's going to happen. Well, look at the wastewater data in the United States where it's going up. This isn't saying absolute numbers. It's just either going up or staying about the same. The real hot spots are Florida and Alabama. <laughs> but you look at, like, emergency room cases, Florida and Alabama, surprisingly not changing. We can anticipate, based on that wastewater data that, and then this map will change dramatically probably two weeks from now. And we'll see increases in Florida and Alabama because the wastewater is going up. Then let's compare our variant population compared to what's coming into the United States. This was taken in late June, and back then uh, you could see that XFG was pretty low, 14% with uh, NB1.8.1 being the, the dominant species. But this is a really cool map that the CDC published that shows the various variants over time, which one becomes dominant and how they change. And I, I've labeled these, these uh, different colors so you can see the evolution of the virus. So you can see back in 23 when XBB was the main variant, it, it was really dominant for a long time, and you can see these individual mutations, not a lot of change, but individual mutations got them slightly more and, you know, would replace the, the previous one. Then JN1 came along, and that was dominant for a while, and you can see individual mutations. And the same thing for KP3, XCC, LP8, and XFG. Now is the dominant one, even in the U.S., but not as high as what's coming in in travelers. XFG in the United States is 30%, it's over 50% in the travelers data. So that's a bunch of garbledy duck in letters. So let me show you what it means. So back in 2023, if you look, these were the two dominant strains, XBB and JN1. They were all uh, related to Omicron. But the one that turned out to be dominant was JN1. So it replaced XBB. And then you can see the evolution kind of went just along that pathway. Little changes in the spike protein led to the KP3, led to XCC, led to LP8.1. And then this is what happens every now and then. There's a recombination event, this time between GN1 and XDB, that led to XFG. And that is now the dominant species. And we can expect, if we follow this evolutionary map, that the next branch of infectious viruses will come off of that branch. Which leads me to a really fascinating paper in science. So we've been talking about bird flu for a while. And the way I've, I've tried to show the bird flu is really comes from the wild uh, waterfowl. And you can see the various water, the fowl pathways. We've looked at the migratory pathways going down the west coast, the middle of the country, and the east coast. And, you know, we've sort of viewed it as each one of those pathways has a particular bird flu uh, variety, uh, the H5N1 virus. But these, these investigators sequenced 3,000 viral genomes that were taken from domestic and wild birds from 2021 and 2024 uh, and look to see at the evolution. And what you can see on the left side of this, this video is the actual migration of birds um, and the, the pathway that they're going in various locations. And on the right side, you can see the evolution of the viral genome. And what's really amazing to me is that it shows that H5N1, highly pathogenic virus that we're very worried about, is constantly intermixing with these low pathogenicity avian influences throughout the country. And you can see that evolution on the right side of the diagram, which means uh, there's a lot of evolution of a bird flu, flu going on. And so uh, we shouldn't be complacent because there's so much genetic evolution that it I think it's almost inevitable that there'll be an event where uh, H5N1 becomes a pandemic. So with that in mind, we need to be thinking in advance, how do we you know, make sure that we're prepared with vaccinations for the, for the possibility that bird flu will become a pandemic. Anyway, I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, I want to welcome the new students in the School of Medicine and Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences who attended orientation this week. 
glad to have them on campus, and I hope they have a wonderful time here at Baylor. Anyway, and uh, congratulations to the Clinical Translational Research Certificate of Added Qualification Program in the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. This program is celebrating its fifth anniversary and just received renewed NIH funding for another five years with eight students per year. So congratulations to the program director. Director, that's really this. The whole idea is to prepare graduate students for translational research careers. So congratulations to the graduate school and the, the whole CTSA crowd. Anyway, uh, another announcement. <laughs> I shouldn't say this. This weekend is my birthday. <laughs> Uh, we're going to pretend it doesn't exist. Anyway, uh, have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to try and have a decent birthday. I will see you next week. <laughs>